The release of controversial documentary Leaving Neverland has sparked a worldwide conversation about child sexual abuse. But does more need to be done to improve our understanding of this sensitive and complex subject? Psychologist Emma Kenny thinks so, arguing that widespread misconceptions about sexual abuse could discourage other victims from speaking out. And someone who knows firsthand the difficulty of coming forward is Rebecca Vardy, who herself was sexually abused at the age of 12. Well, she joins us now to share her story alongside Emma and welcome both of you. Welcome. And thank you very much much indeed for doing this. this is going to be the subject of our phone in later on so the the, the background here controversial documentary leaving neverland that recounted the alleged sexual abuse of wade robson who's now 36 james safe chuck who's 41 by michael jackson since the documentary's release the jackson estate has denied the allegations and is suing hbo for broadcasting the documentary they consider to be libelous Despite an outpouring of support, both men have also had to deal with questions over the validity of their claims, including why it took them so long to come forward with the accusations and why they previously denied being molested. And that's the crux of where we sort of start here. Um, you posted online mm -hmm. recently, um, and this was to dispel the myths. One of them is why would it take so long to... Sp and we're not necessarily talking about that specific case, but in most cases, why does it take so long to come forward? I mean, about seven years before a child will even tell anybody, let alone be it the right person, and often it's middle-aged by the time people talk about it, usually because they love their abuser. Often, a child actually has a deep relationship initially with the person who's abusing them, so disconnecting from them means losing a parent or losing a really good friend, because remember, paedophiles who are child molesters use things like affection, ego, and, of course, friendship lures, and then threat. So there is this very complex experience of the sexual seduction that occurs. That's one of the reasons. Secondly, absolute panic and fear. Did I collude with it? Was I part of it? Did I deserve it? Surely I caused this. And then finally, and this this is one of the really sad things for me and anybody listening who works in my area. About 80% of children who say this happened, they either get told that it didn't or they get disbelieved fully mm. or the impact of saying this happened is so catastrophic. You know, suddenly the police might be there or social services might be there, the parent might be removed, that it's almost easier to say, hang on, didn't really happen at all. And that means that everyone now goes, oh, you're a liar, which means that they don't talk about it for many years. So that, in a nutshell, is the tiny top of the mountain regarding why children don't talk about it and why people don't talk about it until middle age. Oh, another myth that you spoke about was that child molesters can't be kind to children and you sort of oh, touched on this then. This drives me mad. So one of the ways that predators get access to children is being absolutely wonderful, loving, caring, maybe saying that they're the most important child in the world, that they are the most skilled, most beautiful, most intelligent, buying them presents, taking them out on activities, being their most important confidant in their life and then also abusing them. But it's a bit like when we work with DV, domestic violence, you know, if 90% of the time somebody's being wonderful to you and then 10% of the time they're being hideous, if you're vulnerable as well, or you have issues in your life and you feel lonely, and But then also, what are you gonna do? at the time, because you're so young, you don't understand, so you don't know it's hideous. Do you know what? Philip, that's it. One of the big misconceptions is that children, because we don't do a lot of work around safe touch and boundaries with children, we are starting to, you're right, what they feel physically sometimes as well, be aware of this, this idea that predators are being aggressively violent to these children is not true. So the touch itself does not have to be displeasurable or aggressive, but the mental experience can be quite disgusted but conflicted. Mm. Imagine being seven or eight or 10 or 12, and you're dealing with that whole amount, as you said, of non-understanding mixed with, this person loves me, mixed with, am I the well, person blaming? for an adult to understand, let alone a child. Yeah, um, sure. Another misconception is um, how a paedophile looks. Oh. One of the things that you'll see with the Michael Jackson case, obviously, at the end of his career, there was obviously some strange issues mentally with him, whatever, but paedophiles, who are child molesters, so paedophiles can be paedophiles without ever touching a child. Of being a no, he wasn't, so he wasn't, can't, you know, exactly. And I that. can't call it, I can't call it. But a paedophile, remember, it doesn't have to touch children. That can just be somebody with a predilection that never, ever touches a child. So we're talking about a paedophile who's a child molester, molester from child porn onwards. They look like anybody and everybody. They are politicians, they are police officers, they are school teachers, they are vicars, they are priests. They are anybody with access to children. They are the best friends in your family. They are the parents, they are the partners. So unfortunately, it would be great to be able to give 
give you a profile. And I've been asked to do that by a lot of people. And we can't do that because, as I'm sure you'll talk about that, you yeah. don't see them in that well, way. Rebecca, yeah. you spoke out in 2016. Um, it, it really was the, the sort of first time that you'd opened up publicly Amazing. about it. Why, why did you decide it, this is the time? Um, I think for me, a lot uh, that around that point, just before um, Jamie and I were due to get married, a lot of untrue things were being said about me, um, about my character, about the sort of person I was. And I thought, there's a reason I did things I did, looking back right. now. And for me, at that point, when I was doing things like that, when I was, you know, a tearaway child and, you know, drinking and all sorts of things like that, I didn't see that there was a pattern because of what had happened to me when I, when I was younger. And I wanted people to try and understand that I'd been through a lot in my childhood and I'd made a lot of mistakes mm. and I wanted to try and connect what I'd done off the back of what had happened yeah. to me. You were um, only 12, as we said, at yeah. the beginning of this, and this abuse happened on and off over a period of three years. And the first Not myth, a family member. Not a family member. And the myth that we'd spoke about, number one, of not coming out and telling somebody immediately... I mean, this was classic for you. You didn't tell anybody, did you? Because wh why, why was that? To begin, um, to begin with, it was the fear of being judged, um, the fear of not being believed. Um, I did tell my dad and we did go to the police and I, um, I'd made a statement with the police, but I was so... I didn't know what to do myself and I'd been made to feel like it was my fault and it didn't happen and it was all in my head mm. that it got me in such a, such a state that I would withdrew my statement. Um, out of the sheer fear of kind of... No one wanted to believe me. And, well, it's, it wasn't like quite that. as simple as that, was it? Because you were hugely encouraged by your father yeah. to, 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 to go to the police and speak about it. You'd spoken to your mum about it and yeah. got a very bad reaction yeah. from her, and it was, it was your mum's reaction that made you withdraw that statement. Yeah, it was kind of coming from... My mum and my dad split up when, when we were young and I'd been through kind of quite a lot of... Um, kind of backwards and forwards between two parents. And um, I just didn't want any more friction within the family and I didn't want to be the cause of any more friction. So I felt so bad about it that I just kind of said, OK, and went AWOL. And you, I guess, with all of these things, there comes a moment when you decide, right, I need to address this. And it was after you had um, postnatal depression yeah. after the birth of your child that you thought, right, I'm going to go and get some... Help And was that the first time you sort of connected the dots, I guess, in a way, as, a, as an adult, to kind of go, right, this is, this is the reason. It's living with that trauma. That is... Yeah, I think so. I mean, the sort of person I am now, I learned quite a young age to suppress emotions and shut away um, all the kind of negative effects of what happened to me. But I think when I had postnatal depression as well, it all just became too much. Yeah. And at that point, I had children. And I thought, I have to do something, not just for myself, but also for my kids. I don't want my kids to, you know, see mum falling apart and not do anything about it. So at that point, I had to go and get help. When you had your own children, and we saw this once again, you know, we can't specifically talk about that case, well, there isn't really a case, but, um, but, but with the, the, the two guys in leaving Neverland, um, it was when they had their own children that they realised, you know, that as they grew up to be the age that they were when they were allegedly abused. For you, with your mum's reaction and you had your children, did, was that an extra layer of betrayal when you realised that you hadn't had the support that you would, of course, give your children? Yeah, um, it's uncomprehendable. Yeah. I still really struggle with it now and I really try and suppress kind of how I feel because if I think about it too much, I become really angry, really bitter, and I've tried to leave that part of my life as far behind as physically possible mm. to concentrate on the good that I have got and mm. my kids. But if I do think about it, I find it so difficult to understand and so difficult to comprehend how a mother mm. can disbelieve a child. Yeah. Um, irrespective of whether that child is having problems or, you know, has become a bit of an issue or a tear away. Well, we, obviously, she's not here to tell her mm -hmm. side of the story. And, and as we also know, this complicated 
interaction between parents and children and the, if, if, if you do maybe in the back of your head you do believe but then you think of the grenade that's going to go off in the family there is this rationalization in life of how can this be it can't really have happened it must be you that's the problem because then i don't have to orchestrate any change in my life so you can see that in that moment of that inception that people just want to hold everything together but what's being said here is absolutely acute believe your child mm. that's the most important thing and what you've just talked about is so powerful because what we do with children who are often victims of child abuse, their behaviour falls apart, they develop lots of issues with self-harm or suicide, isolation, and they have eating disorders, they act out, they have promiscuous sex, they do all these things, which is all about self-medicating their pain in a painful way that actually says, I don't have value, but takes them away from the issue that they're dealing with. And then everybody blames you, right? Yeah, You're the problem. Yeah. So then that changes the validity and when you come out and say hang on this did happen yeah. you feel like oh well your behavior has been so terrible we have to change the language of how we work with children in this way can i ask you then now so as somebody that has been through such a horrific thing and then you've spoken to your family and then you know you did go to the police you dropped the charges but you've spoken about it publicly you've got professional help day-to-day -day now life like as a survivor of that abuse how how are things do you constantly still have to work on it do you get to a point where you can kind of go, well, that happened, I can't change it, but I can move forward? Um, after I had my little boy, I had a lot of CBT therapy. Mm. And CBT really helped me kind of close that Pandora's box and distinguish or to lose kind of the face of the abuse, it, to become something else. It's more like I now, if I think about it, it becomes a character. Mm. And that really helped me because it kind of separated my life today to what my life was before. Right. And I think I still use that as a coping mechanism if I'm ever having a bad day. And don't get me wrong, there are times that I really do struggle. And there are times that I think, you know what, I, wa I want to make this person suffer. And maybe, you know, I will eventually progress with going back well, to... Well, that's what I was, going, I was going to ask you that, because uh, what you're doing just by being here is <sighs> an incredible help to, and will be an incredible help to so many people just by us being able to have the conversation but also for you you know have you you have obviously thought that whoever this abuser is will be probably yeah. could be watching this or hear about this will be terrified terrified that you're gonna go for See, it i don't again. i don't know whether that's the case i think especially it's... if they could still be abusing now there is that and there and there is part of me that does feel a bit guilty. You don't have Maybe to feel any guilt at all. Because no, no, not I didn't your fault. You carry on you were the victim. Guilt, um, with the case. And, you know, I really hope that that is not the case. But I don't know. I, a part of me thinks maybe he thinks he's got away with it. Maybe he thinks it's in the past and if I was going to do something, I would have done it a long time ago. I don't know. Historic sexual abuse is more and more prevalent. Yeah. And also one of the things that you were talking about there was that letting go of it and leaving it behind. It's not that you kind of let go, is it? It's that you accumulate the fact that you're who you are. You're amazing now. You're successful. You're speaking out about these issues. And every tiny bit of your life that formed you, formed you. Yeah. So it's learning as well to kind of say everything had meaning, even the terrible parts, if you yeah. use it constructively and don't let it destroy you. Well, thank you. Well done. For coming thank in today. Well done. Thank you for I always have about such it. admiration for anybody that comes on this show and speaks yeah, about it. Really the mission she's given to other people's yeah. huge. Well done, you.